Hi folks, Chris Martin here. After finishing my last project on the World Diplomacy Championships of 2016, I've been given a lot of thought about what I want to do next. And I think the project that most inspires me is the idea of doing some training videos for diplomacy. For a long time I wanted to write a book about this, and I still might. This is kind of a place for me to work out some of these ideas. So consider this to be the very first volume in what may be a long series of shorter videos about how to play diplomacy better. You see a lot of uh, common mistakes made that are very easily fixable in my opinion. Now, I'm going to assume that you already know how to play diplomacy. That you've played the game before, you're familiar with the interface, you're familiar with the pieces and, and all of that stuff. I'm not going to start from scratch here. So what I want to do in each one of these episodes is, is take a problem, take a position, examine it, and then talk about what might be done differently. The problem I want to talk about today is unintentionally antagonizing your neighbors. Or maybe it's about sending the wrong message. And there are a lot of ways to do this in diplomacy. And the one that I want to deal with today is submitting orders that don't gain you anything and tell your neighbors that you have it in for them. These are things that you don't want to do. You want to have your neighbors in general believe that you are friendly towards them until you are actively attacking them. Sometimes the time to send that message is with diplomacy, and sometimes the way to send that message is with your moves. More often than not, you will be deploying your diplomacy to lull them into a false sense of security while using your pieces to achieve your tactical goals. With that in mind, I want to look at a game that I was in recently where Germany made this mistake both in the spring and in the fall of 1901. So straight out of the gate, whatever it is that they're saying to their neighbors, they have antagonized both France and England to absolutely no gain for themselves. And this is the kind of thing that I see happening all the time. You're out there negotiating, people are talking around, and then people put in their orders. Now, if you're a good player, you are always looking at the whole map, at every move submitted from every piece, because every move tells you something about the intentions of the person who wrote that order. So let's take a look at the spring 1901 moves from Germany. All right, so I'm using Backstabber here uh, as my you know frame of reference. And let's take a look at the German orders. We've got Kiel to Denmark, very standard. Berlin to Kiel, very standard. And Munich to Burgundy. Now, Munich to Burgundy from Germany is a great order if you get there. Well, let's just say it's a good order if you get there. If you don't get there, it's a terrible order. You've done nothing to advance your position, and you've told France that you are trying to sneak into their homeland. Now, there are a thousand reasons why you might see this set of orders. France might have asked Germany for a bounce. Right? Hey, let's both move to Burgundy. Neither one of us will get there. And that's going to provide us with a measure of security. It's a, a demilitarized zone and arranged standoff, like you see in the Black Sea. You see over here in the Black Sea, you see an arranged standoff, probably here in Galicia. You'll sometimes see one in the English Channel. Now, it's a little unusual for France to ask for that, but it could happen. This could be part of Germany believing he's part of a three-way attack on France, where England is going to open to the Channel, and Italy is going to open to Piedmont. But in this case, that's not what happened. None of those things happened. So we have to just assume here that somewhere along the line, there was a failure of diplomacy. What could Germany have done differently that would have been better? Almost anything. Really, just holding in Munich would have been better, because it would send the message that I'm not trying to get into Burgundy. He could have gone to Tyrolia, 
which would have prevented the Italians from rolling their armies north. Now, that could be antagonistic towards the Italians, but you're probably going to be thanked by the Austrians. Uh, he could have gone to Ruhr, the other common opening for Germany. When Germany opens Munich to Ruhr, this is sort of the vanilla German standard. I'm going to Denmark to give myself the option in the fall of deciding the fate of Sweden uh, opening. So, spring 1901, okay, not so much of a disaster, but if France saw you coming, they supported themselves in. Now, they're in Burgundy, and you aren't and you're stuck in Munich, you're not adjacent to a neutral center here in, in Belgium or Holland, you have no influence on it, you've got a, a tougher row to hoe ahead of you. So, that's spring 1901. I would argue a minor mistake, not good, but not necessarily terrible. Let's take a look at fall of 1901. Something really bad has happened here. The orders were Denmark to the North Sea, Kiel to Holland, and Munich to Burgundy. Let's think about those orders for a minute, because there's two bad orders in there. The worst order in that set is Denmark to the North Sea. What was Germany thinking? Was Germany thinking he was going to get into the North Sea? Well, if he was, that's an interesting choice, because there is no way he was going to get into the North Sea with Norway free for the English taken because there are no Russian armies in St. Petersburg, and with Belgium and Holland available for a convoy, there's no reason for the North Sea to move. None. Nada. So all you have done as a German in this situation is tell England, hey, if you had left the North Sea, I would have snuck in there. And not taken Denmark. Let's be clear. That would have resulted in not building if you had arrived. So, if this is a no-press game, maybe this is a signal to France that, hey, I know I tried to get into Burgundy in the spring, but hey, let's go attack England. It's a terrible order. It's just about the worst possible thing you could do here. Now, if you want Sweden to be Russian, great. Don't move to Sweden. I'm all about that. But there is no reason to let England know that you have any kind of hostile intent to them at this juncture. Kiel to Holland? Don't have any objection to Kiel to Holland. That's a fine order. Munich to Burgundy. Okay, so there's, a I guess, a non-zero chance that Burgundy was going to go to Belgium. Now, if Burgundy goes to Belgium and arrives. Then you have successfully gotten into Burgundy as Germany. And what are you going to do from there? Presumably you're going to take Belgium from him. That's the play there. That's what you're setting up. Now, in this case, what makes this a bad move is that it is coupled with the move on the North Sea. What Germany has said to both of his neighbors here is, given the opportunity, I'm going to attack you. And I'm going to attack you in a suboptimal way, in a way that is really not great for me. Giving them all the incentive in the world to work together against you. Now, if you look at this French position, where you're going to end up with the fleet in the Mid-Atlantic Ocean almost certainly going to Portugal, an army in Marseille almost certainly going to Spain, you're going to have a France with two or three builds. And what you want France to do in that situation is to choose to work with you against England instead of working with England against you. Because this is a great situation for France to build fleet breasts, try and get into the channel, try to get back, you know, walk back to the Mid-Atlantic Ocean, and then have the entire backside of England available. Maybe build the third fleet if he ends up getting Belgium. This is your dream as Germany. This is what you want. By going to Burgundy, again, you're saying, ha ha, you can't trust me. I am not going to give you the opportunity to back England because I am going to try and take advantage of any step you give me. And what that tells good players is, do not give this person a step. Shut them down. Eliminate them. 
work with the neighbor who at least is writing reasonable orders. So, is it, as it happens, Burgundy is supporting Tyrolia to Munich, and Germany is in for a world of hurt in this game anyway. What are you going to do? I feel like uh, that German asked for that, right? If you're France, and you're in Burgundy, and Germany tried to sneak in, and Italy comes to you and said, hey, why don't you support me into Munich? There's a, a much better chance that France in that scenario is going to say, sure, why not? It hurts Germany, doesn't hurt me that much. I figure Italy can't hold Munich later if I decide to come and take it from him. Let's go. So, this is just one example of how your moves that seem to not make a big difference. They're small moves, it's opening seasons, but they have an outsized impact on your relationship with your neighbors. If you are England in this scenario, is there any reason why you would ever choose to work with Germany? Not that you might not have to work with Germany at some point in the future, but that's going to be way, way down on your list of things you want to do. Similarly with France. So, my advice here is that when you're putting those orders in the box, you think not just about what is the tactical goal that I want to accomplish in the, in the short term, but what is the message that I am sending with these moves? How are my neighbors and even people on the other side of the board going to interpret what I have done? Because I assure you that they are watching and they are making that judgment call. So what's the main takeaway here? For me, it's that everything you do is going to be watched and judged by others. And that an order that seems on the surface to be harmless can in fact mean the end of your game as early as the, the fall of 1901. I don't think that Germany went on to glory from that position, nor should they have, because this is a game about forming alliances, forming partnerships, working with them, and then leaving them behind once they are no longer useful. And what those moves say to, I think, an experienced player is that this is not someone with whom I can work, even in the short term. That's it for my first edition of a Diplomacy Academy series. Let me know what you thought. Leave a message in the comments. Give me a like. And if you want to subscribe, I'm back in the business of making diplomacy videos. Until next time, I'm Chris Martin, and I'll stab you soon.